Well, this uh, last Thursday, something uh, wonderful happened. Know what it is? Oh, come on, spring! <laughs> spring arrived. And, you know, I love winter. We all love winter, as evidenced by our multiple trips to ask orthopedics, but we all love winter. <laughs> and uh, I get the feeling, though, that most of us who are here a lot uh, are very grateful that spring has finally sprung. Before you know it, snow will be gone. Barbecues will be staples, and we could sit chairs out along Brush Creek Road and not see a car pass for five long minutes. <laughs> but one thing I love about spring uh, is the opportunity to, to fly fish again. And while I have fished in the middle of winter, uh, frozen eyelets on fly rods and frozen fingers is not much fun at all. Right, Alan Adger? He was out yesterday, apparently, floating the river for eight hours. Can you imagine that in yesterday's weather? Well, <clears throat> I've learned over the years that everything in life, and in everything in life, there are extraordinary lessons. I mean, as I write each week in The Mountaineer, if you just open up your eyes, there's a lesson in any and everything that we see. And the same applies to fly fishing, for sure, as is evidenced by the many books written on such a subject. And there is, in fact, Great meaning to a little insect called the mayfly. I don't know if you all know a mayfly. And I've mentioned this before to some of you, but mayflies uh, have a very intriguing life cycle. As little fellows, uh, they spend up to two years underneath the surface of the water growing up. And then one day, they emerge to the surface of the water, whereupon they change into adults, they rise up off the surface of the water, they mate, and within a day, they're dead. Now imagine that, two years growing up, you finally break through the surface of the water and you're dead. Now, their adulthood is radically short and it's probably why mayflies are from the order called ephemeroptera. This is where we get the word ephemeral, which means lasting only a very short time. Now I understand fully that age is relative, but for years I've realized that when it's all said and done, that our lives are incredibly short. Even 100 years is not all that long when you look at the length of history. And I have to say that in some ways, I wake up every day and I feel like a mayfly. And as a person who believes that like mayflies, our lives are ephemeral, it's pretty clear to me that there is a lack of permanency that characterizes our human condition. And I touched on this briefly in our weekly Mountaineer this week, but I, I want to, again, just share a quick story that I wrote about this week that points to this truth, the ephemeral nature of our life and the ephemeral nature of things. Some of you read it, some of you did not. And as a child, I spent a lot of hours outside, um, weekends outside, and those were the years long before technology took over the choices that children make now with what to do with their free time. And it was during that time with my friends that I spent hours and hours and hours and hours building and constructing things. Legos, Kenners. Remember Kenners? The, the little uh, metal kind of uh, girder systems? Those were cool. I found a box of it the other day. Can you imagine how cool that is? Erector sets. Remember those? Spent hours with that stuff. And we also uh, spent time, my friends and I, as a little guy, uh, building castles and mountains in our sand pile. And we learned quickly that with a little bit of imagination, a little bit of water, the possibilities were limitless with regard to what we could build with sand. And I remember one day, we spent hours and hours and hours building a series of castles and moats. It was really awesome. And the moats were ideal to hold hose water. If you put the hose on a little bit, the water would fill up the moats and kind of go around. It was really neat. And we envisioned knights and battles and horses, and it was princesses and kings. It was awesome. Well, at the end of that day, I still remember this day, I was probably seven years old, I remember crawling into bed and feeling so excited to play the next day with the castle and moats we just built. But it was then, as a seven-year-old, that I learned a very hard lesson. See, for some reason, we left the hose on as the sun set and we went inside. And during the course of the night, water filled up the sand pile so that by morning the castles and the moats were gone. And I was sad, I was frustrated, I was heartbroken, but it was then I remember getting a glimpse at an absolute truth about life. 
Now, it's not a truth that I like all the time. I don't like it all the time. I don't necessarily enjoy it. But nevertheless, it's a truth. And that is that everything with one exception, like it or not, everything is temporary. And what's unfortunate is that sometimes we engage with life in a way that we ignore that truth. The result, we worry, we stress, we drink, we overexercise, we try and build things without acknowledging that everything passes. We try and reverse time and run from age instead of embracing the wonder of accumulated wisdom and knowledge. We try and hold on to things or ways of being instead of learning the grace of letting go. We get stuck with ways of thinking or approaching things. We lose flexibility and the ability to adapt. And we, in fact, if we run from the ephemeral nature of things, we can lose the gift of joy and the recognition of the beauty and the wonder of the moments, the very temporary moments. Back to the temporary in a little bit. As you all know by now, our gospel reading today is from the Gospel of John, and in it we heard the story of the woman at the well. And what is intriguing, it's an intriguing little tidbit, is you may not know that this is the longest recorded discussion anywhere in the Bible that Jesus has with a person. Now, I certainly don't believe this is the longest talk Jesus had with somebody, obviously, but it's the longest recorded talk that he had with a person. So given that it's the longest recorded talk, I figure we probably should pay some attention to the story. And it is a story with layers and layers of meaning and life lessons. Now in the story, as we heard, we're told that Jesus takes a long walk, he heads into a region of Israel called Samaria. And Jews and Samaritans of that day hated each other for a variety of reasons, and both were at fault. Now, Samaritans were Hebrews. They shared similar blood to the Jews, but they had, over the years, intermarried with Assyrians and a bunch of other people. And because of this, Jews thought Samaritans were impure. And they disdained them just for that reason alone. But the Samaritans also built a temple outside of Jerusalem and said, look, to worship God, you don't have to go to Jerusalem to do so. That really ticked the Jews off too. And they hated each other. And they both, both sides, engaged in toxic, harmful, destructive, tit-for-tat behavior. They killed each other. They didn't communicate with one another. Now in our gospel story, Jesus completely strikes out in the eyes of many for a variety of reasons. First, Jesus, a Jew, to go right into a Samaritan region would have been considered outrageous and scandalous. It'd be like a Republican walking down the hall and talking to a Democrat, <laughs> or vice versa. That's strike number one against Jesus. How dare he go to Samaria? Jews don't do that. And it's in an area of Samaria that Jesus goes to a well in this small town named Sychar. And it's at the well that Jesus' beyond the pale behavior continues. Just outrageous. Not only is he in Samaria, but he talks to a Samaritan and a woman no less by asking her for a drink of water. Strike number two against Jesus. Men don't talk to women that are alone. Bad, bad, bad. It then becomes evident that the woman with whom Jesus is speaking has some slippery morals. Strike number three. Here is Jesus, a Jewish man in Samaria, talking with a woman, a woman whose conduct history would have been considered to be over the top and therefore someone to be avoided. It's just the way it was in those days. Strike number three, how dare he do that? And finally, strike number four. Jesus, a Jew, is spending time with a non-Jew. Forget about the fact she's a Samaritan. Jewish men weren't supposed to hang out with non-Jewish men. Bad, bad, bad. Strike number four. Jesus, in that setting at the well, crosses every conceivable boundary and social convention that was present. There was nothing more he could have done that would have been scandalous. <laughs> now, it's in the discussion with the woman that it's clear that she has spent her life looking for love in all the wrong places. It's clear that she's been searching for the right things in life, but in the wrong ways. It's also clear she is deeply in trouble. 
Jesus then says this to her, everyone who drinks this well water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become a spring of water welling up into eternal life. So what's this story about? What does it have to do to us? Well, there's a lot I could say, but I just want to focus on three little short takeaways for us to think about. The first of which may make us a little uncomfortable. First, as I mentioned, Jesus crosses every social convention possible in that scene. By entering into Samaria, by talking to a woman, by talking to a woman with questionable morals, and by spending time with a non-Jew. People would have gossiped about him. But let us remember who it is that is crossing such boundaries. It's Jesus, it's the Messiah, it's God in the flesh, the one who puts a face on God and lets us know how God sees things. And the story, frankly, is a very powerful and potentially very uncomfortable reminder to us to be very cautious about any boundaries we put up with other people. To be very careful when we group people together in a category and discount a person because they have the characteristics of a certain profile. Now, I believe this is a message we desperately need to hear, especially now in America and even in this valley. We are deeply divided. There are many people who disdain one another that don't communicate with others based on profile. Some people even get apoplectic when it comes to people who are parts of groups with whom they disagree. You've seen it. We may sometimes act this way, but God doesn't. We may rage in this way, but God does not. We may get ticked and sell certain and condescending, but God doesn't. And the story of the woman at the well, one takeaway, is that it's an invitation for each of us to ask, what group of people makes my blood pressure rise? Democrat? Republican? Tea partier? Social progressive? Muslim? Rich? Second homeowner? Local, Christian right, IRS, Jew, evangelical, Brazilian, (laughs) snowmobiler, environmentalist, Fox News watcher, MSNBC fan, fracker, Texan. (laughs) For those who don't know, I'm a native Texan, just. So the story of the woman contains a clear and direct message. It's a powerful reminder for each of us to look at each person as a person to dispense with putting them into a categorical group. To rid ourselves of disdain and anger towards those who differ and have varying opinions or backgrounds. To remember that when we avoid others as Jews and Samaritans avoided each other, we are traveling on a path that God does not share with us. Remember, it's the longest recorded chat has in the Bible with a person. Look at the setting, the context, the boundaries. And perhaps rising blood pressure and anger should serve as a call to listen, reach out, and talk. Not engage in knee-jerk reactions. Now, this is a hard lesson, at least it is for me, because we've become so accustomed to grouping people together in our culture. And we live in a society in which it's culturally acceptable and where we're even encouraged to do the opposite of what Jesus did with the Samaritan that day. Another very different takeaway from the story has to do with the woman herself. Her life's been hard. She's in a tough place. She's likely rejected by many in her own community. She's empty. Remember, Jesus refers to her thirst, and he's not referring to (coughs) physical thirst. She's thirsty and hungry for meaning for love, security, safety, to be needed. She's not full of herself. She has room for something or someone much greater than herself. She didn't have to respond to Jesus. She could have walked away, but she didn't. And it's in her place of utter brokenness, confusion, hurt, seeking, that she has an encounter with Jesus. And it's a very straightforward reminder to all of us. God will meet you and meet me in the places in which we hurt the most, struggle mightily, are confused and searching for answers and for meaning. And I believe it's precisely in those places that God meets us because it is in those places we have the most room for God. All of us here today, without exception, regardless of how connected you are with this truth, all of us have burdens, scars, 
places of profound disappointment and hurt. But it's precisely in such spots that Jesus waits for you and for me to offer us healing and sustenance and clarity and direction. And the story of the woman of the well is a poignant reminder of that. You want to meet God, turn to your darkest places, and there he waits. And finally, there's more to the story. As I've said, the woman at the well was thirsty. And ultimately, I believe she thirsted to find a foundation in her life that was solid, unmovable, unchangeable, and resistant to the chances and changes in life. She had looked everywhere for a foundation in her life but one place. And her life was unhappy as a result. And the fact that her life and so much in her life was fleeting and temporary, and she didn't know how to deal with it, she didn't know what to stand on, it threw her into a downward spiral of despair. So Jesus had an invitation to that woman, and it's an invitation, I believe, that he extends to you and to me, not only today, but tomorrow, the day after that, whenever we're ready to accept it. And I believe if we could hear Jesus speak right now, that he would say something like the following to each of us. Please, 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 Jesus says, ground your life on me. Make me the launching point for everything you do and say. Make me the foundation for your entire life, for every relationship, for every challenge, for everything you do each and every day. Make me the springboard from which you start each and every day. Jesus says, remember everything, everything, everything is fleeting and temporary. And in fact, the temporary nature of things is not something to fear. It's not something to hide from. It's not something to try and run and hide from. Rather, if you make me, Jesus says, your solid, unmoving, unchanging foundation, you then are freed to live in the midst of what's passing. Because you have me as your foundation, you are free to let go. You are free not to worry. You are free not to fret. You are free to live with joy and fullness and a go for it attitude because I am in charge of your life right now, your life tomorrow, and I'm in charge of your eternity. Just as I am for other living, every other li living being, Jesus said. So Jesus asks you today, are you thirsty? Are you looking for something permanent in an ephemeral world? Here I am, he replies. So this week, I pray that each of us will ponder the story of the woman of the well. Things are melting around here. There's water flowing in different places. When you encounter water, just pause and look at it for a moment. And think about what water it is that is quenching your thirst, whether it's temporary water or the water that Christ offers. I pray this week that each of us will ponder the story of the woman of the well and that we will step out of the trap of grouping people together with disdain and instead relate to each and every human being as an individual and child of God. I pray that we will turn to the places within, and we all have them, where there's hurt and there's heartache and there's pain, knowing that it is precisely there that we will encounter the power of Christ. And finally, I pray that in a world that feels as if nothing, as if nothing is permanent, and as if everything is built on castles, of, uh, castles built on sand, I pray that we will turn to and build our lives on the solid, immovable foundation of Jesus Christ. And let us pray.